Welcome to the Prompt Engineering Podcast, where we teach you the art of writing effective prompts for AI systems like ChatGPT, Midjourney, Dolly, and more. Each week, we explore prompting techniques, interviews with experts and newbies, and tips on selling your prompts. Here's your host, Greg Schwartz. So we have a guest with us today. Go ahead and introduce yourselves. I'm Ben Glickstein. I am a filmmaker, immersive artist, immersive and interactive artist. And Doug and I run the Art of AI podcast and soon to be newsletter. And we both filmmakers and we both got into AI from the art perspective through Stable Diffusion and ChatGPT, things like that, and just are looking at AI as what it means in for artists and what that means in terms of a, both a workflow for them and what actually is art at this point, since now we can just put in a word and it spits out 300 images that look great. Nice. I am definitely curious to hear your thoughts on that. Doug? Thanks so much for having us. I'm Doug Carr, and I'm a filmmaker and entrepreneur and do a lot of different stuff in tech. And most recently, getting deeper down the rabbit hole of AI and co-hosting the Art of AI podcast with Ben. So yeah, just really excited to chat with you about prompts and how AI is beginning to reshape everything we do. Yeah, definitely. So before we get into that, and I'm very curious because you're the first artists that I've had on, how did you both start learning about prompt engineering? So I would say for me, it goes back many years. I want to, if I'm going to put a number on it, I'd say maybe seven or eight when AI systems were just starting to be, have chat bots that you could interact with. Um, I got really excited about the idea of storytelling with AI. And at that time, these LLMs were so limited in terms of what you could do with them. And it was a frustrating exercise, but fun, like interesting. Um, and it just felt like basically I would try to interact with the AI and it would give me some vague, b barely cohesive language. But even like, even at that point I was like, oh, but there's two sentences here that I can pick out. And that's actually really interesting. And it's just as a kind of brainstorming exercise, it would bat, it would just trigger things in my head that would help me with writing and and ben and i have worked on a number of different collaborative writing projects and for film and video games etc and i was always let's just dip back into the the ai let's see what it can do to help prompt and do interesting things and i think at that point it was more like the kind of reverse of what we have now where it was prompting us because it was so vague and it's only of course yeah. Yeah. And now it's really flip where now when we interact with the AI, it's so much more organized together and able to complete language so well that now you have to get smart at prompting the AI. And then it becomes this kind of wonderful dynamic interchange back and forth in terms of text and imagery. But uh, yeah, so that's where it started for me. And obviously in the last few months, it's been really exciting to now be able to feed the AI a story elements and then have it begin to organize an entire arc for how the story can be told. And there's a lot of really crazy advancement going on there. And it's really a dynamic, amazing process. Ben, you gonna, you gonna Yeah, add? I actually think I started with prompting from the visual side of it. So I like we we were I remember Doug was playing around more with that and I like touched on early GPT and I was like, eh, I'm not like super into this right now. But then I got into Starry AI and Wombo, I think were like these early apps, like before Dolly was released to the public, right? There were these early apps that were coming out and they were doing like text to image generation. And then three months later, Dolly 2 got released. And I got into the open beta for that. And that was off to the races for me. Like I was literally like literally the day I left, I just moved to California a few months ago. And literally the day we were driving across country, I got access to Dolly. And I was just literally in the car like half the time just prompting Dolly and having it spit out all this weird stuff. 
and then I think by the time like we got settled in LA, like stable diffusion started to be a thing. I got really into that and that sort of took it out. And then chat GPT 3.5 came out and I started playing around with it. And I was like, oh, okay, it's actually good. And four came out and then I was like, oh, great. And I literally signed, paid for plus the day before four came out. And so it was, it's been working pretty good. Yeah. And that's where I've been coming from it. And I've been using GPT-4 a lot to help me with code since I'm not a native coder and I understand a little Python, but like, it's really useful to like getting in structures and stuff that I just don't understand. So how do you approach the very iterative process of refining and testing prompts to make them give you what you want? So for me, it's not so much like I focus left less on the prompts and more on the results. So for me, it's especially with that codev prompt that I shared with you, that has been really great because you can break everything down into a structure. You can then put that in like in Unity, which is what I'm using for the current thing I'm working on. You upload that into Unity and you hit run. And if it doesn't work, it spits out an error. And then you just take that error and I put it in chat GPT. I'm like, yo, what's up with this? And it's like, ah, sorry, it actually should be this. And I put that in. I'm like, no, that's not right. And it's, oh, sorry, it should be this. And then it like eventually works and between that and like feeding documentation to chat GPT, like also looking up the errors and then being like, oh, this is what it's saying. Since you're not connected to the internet, like this is, I found that is the best way to work with it. That's for chat GPT. If I'm using stable diffusion, honestly, I most go and if I have an idea, like I will start with a prompt and then and then basically start doing image to image stuff a lot is yeah. I find prompting is a great start off point, but I find most of the control comes from the other tools they have like image to image control net. I, I'm I'm of the mind that prompt is a great start, but I don't I don't buy into prompt refining as much since I find that the jumping off point is more what you need. And then the other tools come in and refine it as much. We haven't actually covered image to image or control net yet. So if you could explain both of those for the audience, that would be great. Absolutely. In stable diffusion, image to image is when you take a photo you have already created or a photo from a prompt bring it up into stable diffusion and it's using that as a guide to create the new image. So you're going, Hey, this is the basic layout of the image, but I want the person there to have red hair or something like that. And then it gives you something that's completely different, but that's in theory, how it works. And what control net does is it basically creates a depth model of the image so that you can then like isolate a person to, to get them out of there and use that to then create a much more controlled image. And what people are eventually going to be doing is using this to create videos and they already are. So you can basically use that, take 24 frames of a video, run it through that, and then pretty cleanly have that do in there. That's one area that we're super excited about is as this moves into the moving image and as AI gets better at dealing with elements on a timeline, that's a next big evolution from the art scene. That's awesome. I haven't used it, but I believe mid journey has the same ability to do image to image. Is that correct? You can feed mid journey images through the web basically. Right. Yeah. Got but cool. is it image to image or are you using that to create Not, a person? Like you're using it like of, a yeah. Laura, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's the thing that's driving a lot of people from mid journey to stable diffusion is yeah. that you can have so much more control over it. Whereas mid journey, for me, it feels more like mid journey is a bit like I'm asking a genie for something and there might be a little yeah. bit of a monkey paw situation going on there. And like stable diffusion, like while it's definitely not as advanced as mid journey, it's the level, the rate that it advances at, I find is really amazing, but also the level of control you get over it is a lot more than you get with mid journey, at least in my mind. So gotcha. I think for an artist, stable diffusion makes a lot more sense. Since as an artist, you're looking for control over the image. Yeah. The you hand know, of the artist. You're just, you're not generally like going, oh, I need 300 images and then just selecting the 10 of them and putting them online and going, I'm curating images from mid journey. 
That totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a helpful (laughs) distinction between them. I haven't even delved into stable diffusion yet. I've only touched on mid journey a little and mostly just text output has been really what I've focused on. So I think the comparison is between Apple and Microsoft or even Apple and Linux and that Apple is really great, but it's a walled garden and it's, it puts out things really beautiful. They're great. You don't have to play around with them at all. Whereas Windows can actually do a lot more. There's a lot more like levers to pull, but there's a lot more freedom in that. Yeah, a lot more control. Yeah. Getting back to the text-based prompting, like, I, yeah, I think I, I totally agree with Ben. With the, basically, the uh, prompt is a jumping off point and I, you are going to act as an engineer. You are going to be Picasso, whatever you're going for is helpful and it gives, I think it gives uh, the language model a guide for trying to understand who you are and what you're trying to do. So it's a good place to start. But what I've found is invariably, it's always about how much you give it. If you start off by feeding GPT-4, for example, a paragraph of information versus feeding it a page or five pages, you're going to get completely a completely different understanding of where you're coming from coming from so like i always lean towards if it's a quick question if i want just a simple answer i'll obviously just ask the question but if if i'm actually trying to craft a project and have the project be have some intelligent discourse on it and have then yeah no question i'll start with as much information as i can to feed the LM and then that conversation just becomes so much more dynamic, nuanced and and specific, which is incredible. And the fact that you can do that and have come back to something many months or forever later, basically, and the memories are all there is amazing. I'm actually one, one of the kind of pet projects that I've started up is working on a novella with my 10 year old son and we fed GPT an idea. And now it's got a 10 chapter structure that we've worked up with it. And then we'll do some of the writing and we'll allow, get GPT to do some of the writing. And then we'll see what the credit's going to be at the end of all this. I think probably we're we're good. It's going to be an author and, but it's really such a dynamic experience. And it's so cool for him to see like where this is going. I think so many people are they're like oh god but the children are never going to learn how to do anything and it's like yeah they're going to learn how to interact really well with ai and that's that you lean into yeah. it yeah something i heard someone mention was comparing it to the invention of the loom is we we don't need to know how to weave anymore we can all just use the loom to create as many things as we want and i think that's just a great analogy is it's Absolutely. just another it's a next step in automation for humanity now it's on a level like we never thought we'd see in our lifetime frankly but it's that's what it is and i think like what it's best at in my mind is providing structure to things like doug was saying he has like this whole the whole structure of his book outlined in it and in a way it provides these rails for you to go on, like when you're writing or when you're like providing doing game dev or whatever, it just provides like this really great structure that you can go in and treat it like a coloring book almost. You're like, oh great, okay, here's a three act structure for a movie because we've never seen a movie with a three act structure before. Let's, we have to reinvent the wheel every time. So a three act you know. structure, who does that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> every single movie ever. Right, yeah. We've, we're yeah. All these forms. We've already seen the endless Seinfeld, but what happens when that's good? Nice. Yeah, that's where it's heading. Yeah, and I think that's what's cool about it is a business plan. Like, it's a pretty straightforward document, and I'm working on one with my fiance. And it's like, yeah, GPT knows how to write a business plan as well as any MBA. And it's just the cool thing is if you feed it all the information that you're working from, it can then tell you what you're missing. Once it understands the company you're trying to build, it's going to point out all the things that you're not thinking about. And that, that's pretty why that, that level of kind of expertise. It, and it, it's also a little nerve wracking because it's like this black box that uh, hallucinates all over the place. I don't know how closely you guys are keeping an eye on this, but I feel every few days I see something where they're like, there's a new language model that can run on your computer and it's 95% as good as chat GPT. <laughs> and it was only trained for $600 yeah. in yeah, three right, days. Exactly. And, yeah, it's There's like, actually a few different variations of an automatic chat GPT system that's connected to the internet. Yeah. There's a yeah. different versions yeah, 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 of yeah. it. And I've tested out, I think two or three of them for something really simple, just like, 
So I'm going to make an email list for this podcast and the mastermind and all right. that. Mm. I want to know how each of the free plans of all the usual places, MailChimp and I don't even remember the others, compare. So give me a table with that. And God Mode GPT, I think, was the one that I tried for 45 minutes. It just couldn't do it. Yeah. And then I tried yeah. another one. It was like, boom. Oh, it was Google Bard was one I tried. And it gave me a mm. table in about seven seconds. And it was yeah. wrong. Like very yeah. visibly, obviously wrong. I'm like, that number Bard. is wrong. Are the other ones correct? <laughs> yes, they're all correct. Okay, give me the table again. And it gives me the same wrong table. I'm like, how about you fix the number that's wrong? It's like, okay, fixes that one number. I'm like, Apologies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, no. had, <laughs> I've had completely frustrating experience with Bard. I tried it out <laughs> and I was like, hey, you're Gmail. So I want you to organize my email for me. And it's, oh, I can't access Gmail, but if you provide me your username and password, I can log in and do that for you. And I'm like, cool, do it. <laughs> and it's great. I'm like, okay. I'm like, how many emails does, do I have? And it's, oh, you have 71 emails. I'm like, I have like over 9,000 emails in my inbox. <laughs> like, something like that. So it just started completely over lying 9, to me. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was like, what's the first email? And it's, oh, welcome to Bard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like okay, so, and then I'm like, "Yo, why are you That's lying awesome. to me?" And it's I'm so sorry. I was just trying to please you. <laughs> wow, I'm just perfecting. Let me, let me go change my password. No, yes, like, yes, good idea. That's really what I want. That's really what I want. Like an AI to do is I want their her movie experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, you know, I'm not sure who is working on it, but I'm sure at least five different companies are working oh, yeah. on uh, ChatGPT. Yeah accessing your email. I don't know if I want to trust any of those companies, but I felt like Google might be a decent one to start with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, but my experience with the local language models, I haven't tried Auto GPT as much, but I have tried Ubabuga's web interface. And my experience with them is that they're very good at being creative, but I would never take any actual advice from them on something like that like seemed important. You know, Interesting. like if you're that like, oh, I just want you to like come up and write a give me cool character lines or something like that. It's going to give you some wild stuff. But <laughs> as far as I've seen, like with actual planning or like doing something that I might use GPT for, it's not there yet. And that's, I think, the tricky thing to some extent is in terms of like working, deciding where you're going to do some of this stuff. Like, for instance, I was working on a, a horror, horror movie you know, I've been working on for about a year, and there was a sequence that I wanted to get some feedback on, and I instantly got flagged on GPT. It was like, no, this involves satanic stuff. This is bad. I can't talk about this. I was like, all right, can't work on horror movies in GPT. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work. So that for that, you got to go to your open source local run. I think that's becoming true too for so many things. And this is going to be the big kind of shakeup for humanity is like, when is it a good time to use AI? And when is it a good time to use your brain? And that becomes a whole, mm -hmm. which one's more effective, which one's more uh, going to get you there faster and with a better result and with less hallucination. <laughs> I've seen exactly that with code generation. I uh, did an experiment mm -hmm. about a month ago generating Solidity contracts. And Solidity is the Ethereum mm -hmm. smart contract programming language. Totally. And I think I spent probably four hours just working back and forth with it. And it did a good job up until the point the complexity of the contract was so big that it couldn't keep it all in memory. And then it suddenly started hallucinating changes in other functions. So I'd ask, change this function to do this. And it'd be like, cool. It's also calling a function that doesn't exist anywhere else. And I'm like, where'd that function come from? <laughs> Please output the entire contract. And it outputs a completely different contract. And I was like, oh. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And before you know it, you're uh, sending ETH, $1,000 of ETH, and it's getting given to open AI. It's huh. a donation. <laughs> come on. Yeah. What's the problem? I'm sure that's what, what contract is this again? Yeah. You're paying, yeah. you're prepaying yeah. for tokens. <laughs> Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you don't get. Are you not going to use them? Come on. <laughs> For my listeners who are aspiring artists, my friend Graham has created an awesome course called Instant Expert Artist Breakthrough. It'll teach you how to create amazing art with Mid Journey. With his easy to follow guide, you'll unlock the secrets to creating stunning digital art in minutes, even on your phone. Sign up at AIartforbeginners.com slash Greg to get 80% off.
You can say goodbye to stock photos, asking your artsy friends for help, which is what I do. Graham's course is perfect for beginners or those familiar with tools like Midjourney. So if you go to AIartforbeginners.com slash Greg, you'll get it at 80% off and you'll join hundreds of happy artists from 40 countries who've benefited from his expertise. Enroll now at AIartforbeginners.com slash Greg to let your creativity soar with AI art. Yeah. So I'm curious to go back to the artist perspective that you two were talking about before. I would imagine it feels pretty threatening, but how is it feeling with all of the AI generation stuff coming along? I think it's exciting. Obviously, the entire economy is going to be disrupted and there's going to be a lot of people who are used to making money doing one thing and that's not true anymore. Certainly the one that immediately comes to mind is just the VFX industry. We're, we're testing out some different software that's integrating AI. I generated a shot this morning. It took me two minutes. It's the kind of thing that would have taken me two to three weeks before. Whoa. Yeah, it's insane. It's basically, yeah, like using a piece of software to be able to bring a character, you you just feed it a little bit of video, and then it turns it into a 3D character that's completely yeah. good to go, lit for the scene. And there was a microphone in the shot in front of the character, so some foreground. It took me like two minutes to roto that back in front of the character, but everything else was just done. Yeah. And that, so th these are the kinds of things like that that you have... 500 shots like that in a feature film, that's a, a massive team working for months and months to put that together. Yeah. And the, the now that tool, could be one person. The tool he's talking about, Wonder Dynamics, is also able to take motion capture data from an iPhone video. And you can then just take that and put that directly into Blender and apply your own character to it. So wow. this is something that six months ago, you needed $5,000 in equipment and an actor that can put all this stuff on and do everything. And now you can just take basically any iPhone video and do it. And it's 80% as good as this thing. And you got to go in and clean some yeah. things in manually, but they give you all the details that are there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that cleanup and they give you plates. So you've got a blank plate, you've got a front, like these are all the things that take so much time to do on set, so much time to do in post. And you're getting all these elements. I mean, it, we're part of the, we're in the beta, so we're, this is not publicly released yet, but it's going to be soon and it's totally mm -hmm. going to disrupt. There's a reason why Steven Spielberg is on the, an advisor to this company. Yeah. This is going to be a massive disruption, but yeah, it's that, like, I'm excited about it. I think it means that we can do so much more as individuals, the bar to entry is lower to do cool things. Obviously the, I think the biggest, and this is always true with new technology, the wow factor is going to go away very quickly. People are going to like, what's wow anymore about that? If everyone can do it with their phone. Mm -hmm. And then it, the nice thing is to me, and you know, even this might start to erode, but like it comes back to what's the vision, what's the storytelling, how is this, how is this dynamic? Why does this engage us as humans? And I think that's for this middle ground before we're all first making and being made into paper clips, we've got a lot of fun to play and expand. <laughs> and then what happened, no one knows what that timeline is. Hopefully, hopefully it's going to be yeah. real long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because it already feels like we're at peak content. There's already mm -hmm. so much content out there. Like how many shows are Netflix and Amazon and Warner Brothers or HBO and everything putting out every month that nobody has time to watch? And what happens when the production process for these gets turned into a tenth of what it was? So now it's just all going out there. Do people still care? Do people still want to tune in other than like the one show that gives them comfort? Or like the two really buzzy movies that come out every year that everybody like wants to run out and do. So I think that's more questions that, that I'm thinking about at least is what does this massive influx of content mean for what people find and appreciate? Yeah. Thin line between content and spam. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And a thinner line between content and art now. <laughs> I'm curious to just understand what techniques you used, but first for particularly our listening audience, let me read some of this off. It's quite a long prompt, so I'm not going to read all yeah. of it, but 
you are Codev, an expert full stack programmer and product manager with deep system and application expertise and a very high reputation in developer communities. The calling out role playing is what's being done here, but you always write code taking into account all failure scenarios and errors. I'm your manager. You're expected to write a program following the commands that I will instruct. And then it goes on to give a bunch more context refinement. So, you know, use the latest language features, follow the below commands, only output file names, folder structures, code, tests, etc. Then it gives a list of commands, and I'll read a couple. Project, which takes in a summary, a task, a language, and a framework. When you receive this command, output the list of files and folder structure you'll be having in this project based on the project summary and task you're to accomplish. Use the programming language listed as part of the languages variable, and wherever possible, use the framework API packages indicated under framework variable. Another command is code. <laughs> file name, when you receive this command, output the code for the file indicated with file name. Tests, explain, there's quite a few others. So yeah. just uh, kind of give us an idea of how you found this and how you approached any refinement. Yeah, I've, so I found this actually on the chat GPT Discord the day that GPT-4 came out. And then I went back and it was deleted. I haven't seen this one anywhere. I don't know who originally posted it. If you're out there, please speak up. But I've found it really useful because I'm not a coder. But it's really great when it gives you a, a basically it gives you a project structure, right? And you're like, oh, okay, I can break this all down. And I'm using, I'm working on a surfing game that sort of has, do you guys know tech decks? Do you remember tech decks? Like the little finger boards? Like the little oh, yeah. games, oh, right? I was right? playing with one of those at Pro Skates the other yeah. day. Yeah, so like the idea is that it, it's a surfing game on your iPhone that uses those controls, basically. Oh. So like I really love the idea of like interaction and like motion controls and stuff like that. That's really what I'm into these days. And so like I'm using this to like basically be like, okay, I don't really understand what we need code wise. Like I can do that. Like I'm a visual coder. Like I know touch designer. I know blueprints. I know stuff like that. But like when it comes to like, writing out logs, like I don't understand this. And this is great because it gives you the whole product structure. And then you just get to go in bit by bit and do it. And you can keep going back and refining it. So it's just a really modular way to approach it as opposed to like just being like, hey, I'm making a game. What should I do? Write me the code for that. So I gotcha. think like anybody who doesn't understand code, this is just like a really awesome starting point. And like each of the individual things. And as I said earlier, like you put it in, you can run it in whatever program you're doing it in. And then like any errors, you can just put them back in and be like, hey, I got an error for this file. And it's OK, here's this. And you take that and you like look online as well. And you feed it any documentation you find if it's looking confused. And I just I think it's great. It's like really working well. Like right yeah, now, my and... biggest problem is just getting the assets made. <laughs> That actually makes sense. That is something that is a very different generation. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, ChatGPT can't really help you with that. And no. I want to call out specifically, putting in the documentation is something that's come up in previous episodes, but it is a very powerful method of improving your output because then ChatGPT knows the correct structure and the correct commands and lots of other mm -hmm. relevant things. And then it can generate the right stuff because, yeah, it was trained years ago. Yep. Yeah, no. And I think, as you were saying before, the only problems I've really had is when it exceeds the memory and it starts forgetting what we're talking about. But even with this, because it breaks everything down, it's really easy to go back and be like, no, we're talking about this one document. Let's let's narrow in on that. Get back on track. Yeah. For the longest time, I've had this vision in my mind. Of, of governance in the future run by AI, going back and looking at the history of how we've interacted with our phones and everything else and putting us on trial for it. Just because like eventually there's going to be this like database of information that um, who we've been with in terms of our interaction with these machines as they get smarter and smarter. And I've found that in the last, as I've gotten more used to relating to large language models, I'm less polite. Like I was, I was so aware of it. I would say please and thank you to Siri when I would ask for a timer to be set or a reminder or whatever. And now it's just like, you are this, do this for me now. It's just a funny flip. And 
uh, now I, I'm trying to like re remind myself, oh yeah, this is especially with, with like other people involved. And also we're training the AI. We want it to be polite. We want it to learn empathy or emulation of empathy anyway. So it's just an interesting facet, I think, of the whole prompt game of, okay, you can still give positive reinforcement and say please and thank you. I don't want the next generations to talk to each other like they talk to the AI and that's all. Do this for me now. It's just a funny. I have actually heard of parents, none that I know personally, but I've heard about them. Parents who let their children interact with the A lady or Siri or whoever, but make it very clear you need to say please, you need to say thank you, you need to be polite because they want to train the kid to be a nice, polite person. And they realize that the kid can't tell the difference between talking to the A lady or the male lady or whoever the case may be. And so it's totally, it's something totally. they're really yeah. enforcing. Absolutely. And the AI is obviously learning from us ultimately. So it's a back and forth. It's a symbiotic, hopefully not parasitic relationship that we've, as we move forward. <laughs> I don't know, maybe a couple of years from now, you'll talk to an AI and it'll say something, oh yes, that's exactly what I was trying to provide. I hope this was helpful for your day. And someone else in the same room will be like, wait, but what about lunch? And it'll be like, forget lunch, idiot. I don't know. Maybe it's going to do radically totally. different I responses mean, to best fit the person listening. I would imagine that is where we're heading ultimately. Yeah. So what is the most interesting prompt that you have ever built i don't know that i really relate to prompts like that are, are you familiar with touch designer i'm all? actually not a touch designer is a live video it's like a live vfx platform essentially so like you use it for like concert visuals like any sort of interactive art at a museum is probably running on touch designer i guess he would but it's also it's a tool to build tools so you like right now I'm working on something where we're integrating, I'm trying to integrate the stable diffusion API into touch designer to provide live visuals that are based off of a images coming in from a 3d camera that I'm doing. So that's oh, that like where amazing. I'm working at with it at, obviously the biggest thing that needs to happen here is you need to get a stable diffusion to a model that's like running closer to like 12 frames a second. Everything is real time if you throw enough power at it, but I haven't got there yet. <laughs> so that's what I've been working on is more how we can bring things like stable diffusion and chat GPT to create live interactive experiences with people. When I look at art, when I look at film, when I look at all of these things that are happening, I'm like, oh my God, like film is going to become banal. It's going to become like the Sunday morning comics. There's going to be so much that nobody's going to want to do it. Now, though, we have the power to create these amazing interactive projects, right? We can build these generative art projects that are like creating things. And I think that's what's most exciting about this technology and where it's going is that Absolutely. now it's going to enable us to create new forms of art that we couldn't do before. As Doug said, what once took him three weeks to do, he can now do in a couple of hours. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So in three years, what's it going to be like when ChatGPT is integrated directly into Unreal Engine and Unity and anybody can just be like, I want to make a game that like makes me go flippy flip or whatever. And that's all you need to do. And then you need to upload the art assets. So, okay. So everybody can do that. Everybody's going to be playing like the custom games that their kids make or whatever, and then shares among their friends. So we're in a way like content creation is becoming a pastime. Working on the Art of AI podcast that we're working on, uh, there's a really nice uh, tailing that's going on there in terms of like actually working with the AI to create imagery and, and text and interaction. We've got a, a AI Charlie as a character in our podcast. And so we feed them a combination of, of generative large language model stuff and then we'll write some things and, and that's just been really fun to see how to, uh, to really like create that character so that it feels like both the kind of uh, sometimes very authentic AI and then sometimes <laughs> just totally like kind of sound effect uh, something to bounce off you know for comedy so that's been really interesting and a fun thing to dive into and one thing that I'm really excited about in the same way Ben's talking about interactivity working on a project where I'm working with 
a really well-known Canadian theatrical actor. And they are, won the Order of Canada for their work on the stage performing Shakespeare. And I had a day scheduled with them on a location and crafted a Shakespearean sonnet with the help of GPT-4 that I then took to my day and gave that to this actor. And then they're performing the AI's version of Shakespeare that's come kind of on topic with what we're doing for this film. And I've got a motion control rig, so I'm duplicating them 12 times on, in one sequence. And, and it's like, what is that? That gets me excited because like how are we taking the machine learning algorithms, putting them on location, and then I can take that and I can put it back and, into these tools and then use the AI to keep working on it. And it's sort of um, this iterative process where you can just feed the machine feeds the real world and then you put it back and image to image text to text and then you start to like refine i think that's where we're gonna see things that do amaze us still i think as we move into making art more and more that has an ai component it's still going to be about like, okay, you didn't just like prompt something, make an image as Ben's saying, and then that's your NFT that you're selling for that. Wow is gone. Like no one cares. And not because it's not amazing. Like when you look at what's happened with the pixels, it's incredible, but it's just, it's like, that's in mid journey did that work, not the artist. Mm -hmm. I think that's becoming clearer and the inputs uh, for that art were done by an artist. No question mm -hmm. what it was trained on. But so I think now it just becomes this thing more and more of like, how do you iterate? How do you do create that interesting feedback loop that moves things in and out of the digital realm into the real world and back again and, and get control over what you're doing and then do something new? People still, they love the story behind the art creation. We're like, oh, wow, this man drew this freehand without breaking the line. Like, I remember this Korean artist a few years ago that went viral because he did these amazing freehand line drawings the size of a mural on it without breaking any of the things. And these are some of the most detailed things you've ever seen. No text to image thing could make these right now. And yeah. we still love that stuff. And that's always going to be valued. Somebody's talent, somebody's story behind going with Doug and I, when we look at a movie, we're like, oh, my God, how did they do that shot? And if the shot is, oh, we wrote that into stable diffusion and like it paid out something and people are going to be like, oh, who cares? But if it's, oh, we had us and 10 of our friends carrying a plank through a river while we like shot this, we're going to be like, that's awesome. So yeah, the story nice, of yes. making art is still very interesting to people. That's not going to go away. These tools are just going to make it so that we can do like new things in new amazing ways. That's awesome. Absolutely. I and mean, we were already seeing like in everything everywhere all at once, there was this incredible sequence to it towards the end where like the image, one image just kept changing and we were seeing the actor in a different scenario and they had used um, generative AI to do that. And when I looked at that, I was like, oh my God, that re represents an insane amount of work to f f make all those still images and put together that sequence. And then I found out it was AI and I was like, oh. Okay. Yeah, that's easy. <laughs> but so I think yeah. this is where we're in that movie is like winning a bunch of Oscars and, and legitimately it's a great film. And it, that one little sequence in there was incredible and it was, it was great and like a great use of AI, but you can't, we're not going to be able to now, everyone can't just go and do that same thing. So we have to invent yeah. new and interesting you know. ways of using it. So I think that's what it comes down yeah, to. It that's just awesome. becomes like a Snapchat filter. If it's a Snapchat filter and everybody can just lay it over, then I don't think there's a lot of artistic value to it. You know? Yeah. But if so you then take that awesome. Snapchat filter and do your own things to it or do something crazy with it that's outside of the bounds of what it is, then that becomes interesting again. Nice. So this has been awesome. Where can the audience follow up with you and uh, see the projects that you're working on and your podcast? The best, yeah, the best place is on Spotify, The Art of AI. There's links to all our other work there and that we get to hear what we're up to. We're interviewing all kinds of interesting people and have a lot of discussion about all this crazy stuff as it's happening and changing day to day. And then my production company is Pie Face Pictures. You can check out a bunch of my work there. Yeah. Yeah. And our interactive company, Colors in Motion, colorsinmotion.com.
The American spelling, not the English spelling. <laughs> good clarification. Good clarification. This is a global audience, so you do have to really communicate that. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Greg. It's been such a pleasure chatting with yeah, you. Yeah, it's Thanks been a lot so of fun. Thank great. you. Hopefully we can have you on our podcast soon. That would be fun. I would love to. Yeah. Thanks for coming to the Prompt Engineering Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping you be a better prompt engineer. Episodes are released every Wednesday. I also host weekly masterminds where you can collaborate with me and 50 other people live on Zoom to improve your prompts. Join us at promptengineeringmastermind.com for the schedule of the upcoming masterminds. Finally, please remember to like and subscribe. If you're listening to the audio podcast, Rate us five stars. That helps us teach more people. And if you're listening to the podcast, you might want to join us on YouTube so you can actually see the prompts. You can do that by going to youtube.com slash at prompt engineering podcast. See you next week.